Chapter 31, the number 8. Where is thy individuality, Lanu? Where the Lanu himself? It is the spark lost in the fire, the drop within the ocean, the ever-present ray become the all and the eternal radiance, the voice of the silence, Blavatsky, 20 to 1. Number 8 is the number of evolution and is connected with the spiral motion of cycles. It is the number of the inevitable and onward rush of time. Its symbol is the hourglass, also the balance. It is also the winged globe of the Egyptians and the bird of life of the Hindus which carries man from the realm of earth, the lower O of the eight, to the higher realms, the upper O of the eight. According to Stinson Jarvis, our word E-I-G-H-T names the horse god, his Celtic name is E-I-G-H, and the eight hours. These eight horses, or our signs, are still shown harnessed abreast, and the carvings of Java which illustrate our D-A-I God's car. The A-T chambers name the eight hours, eight H-O-R-S-E-S, -E eight notes, eight divisions of the compass, and every other eight or the O-C-T, or O God, who is O-C-T, or eight. The same naming of the eight God, or O-C-T, was continued in the great tower and temple of Be'eluz in Babylon. This was divided into eight separate towers. The Greeks have two O's, naming the sun as the great O, or Omega, and the moon called Omicron, or circle small. These two O's named the sun and moon on which all time calculations were made, and the O God, or OCT, was supposed to be both of them in one. Consequently, he was fully named by the figure 8, and OCT, OCHD, and OCHT name 8 in the Celtic, Gaelic, Latin, and Greek. Therefore we see that they were all the one deity under different names, but fully represented by the figure 8, which shows the small moon above the large sun, or the Omicron above the Omega, and thus names the deity who was both moon and sun in one. Father Smitty wonders why the Druids seemed to pay such deep respect to number eight, but this proceeded from their science, because their service of praise was nearly all vibrational to produce unity of mind through song, and the O.C. God song, or O.C.T.A.V.E., was composed of eight notes. Many writers give to number eight a most sinister interpretation. They attribute to it all that is unfortunate, imperfection, privation, loss, ruin, decay, corruption, and death. While it may present such aspects, they are fearsome only to those who do not know the meaning and object of evolution, those who refuse to face conditions which the great law brings for their instruction and unfoldment. For evolution means ever becoming. That which has fulfilled its cycle of manifestation must give place to something higher, that which is imperfection, because only in part, must be superseded by the more and more perfect. The less evolved forms of life suffer the lack of only that which must be the ultimate result of the step, as the child is deprived of the ripe wisdom of the man, although it has all the faculties by which to acquire that wisdom in the course of growth. That which is lost is that out of which the law of evolution has absorbed the life force, as a rind of an orange is thrown away when the substance of the orange is extracted. Ruin, decay, corruption, and death are all phases of life expression. The rind of an orange may decay, become corrupt, and seemingly die, yet the life substance in it is reabsorbed by the elements, from which there will again be evolved a new form of life. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
to those who bestride the bird of life and boldly face each step in evolution no matter what it may hold for them number eight is the symbol of the good law the wheel of the good law moves swiftly on it grinds by night and day the worthless husks it drives from out the golden grain the refuse from the flower the hand of karma guides the wheel the revolutions mark the beatings of the karmic heart since evolution can advance only by reaping that which is sown number eight is a perfect symbol of balance or cause and effect it is the number of the ceaseless breath of the cosmos the outbreathing and inbreathing by which the equilibrium of the soul is attained it breathes into man the ideals from the higher spheres and draws up from the lower spheres of personality his lower ideals man's ideals are therefore but the divine ideals deformed and colored by his limited conception and understanding of them just as man breathes in pure air and breathes out the same air tainted and more or less polluted by the volatile waste products of his system according to the health and purity of his body is man's outgoing breath pure and sweet and according to his oneness with his higher self and the purity of his thoughts can man breathe out or manifest the ideals indrawn from the higher realms the path of the psychic breath in the body forms a perfect figure eight this however must be understood from its esoteric aspect for there are many mysteries connected with the breath all of which pertain to man's evolution in number four we have squared and laid our cornerstone as far as our physical expression is concerned and in number seven have erected our temple of the living god and are now ready to inaugurate the priestly office in it by means of which we are enabled to enter into the higher circle of number eight where behold all things to us become new in short we are now ready to die to the old for which reason the ancients called number eight death but like so-called physical death this death is but an evolution into a higher state of life another conception of number eight is that of the perpetual and regular flow of the life currents of the universe the evil being consumed to make way for the good if we find a bad crop this season we plow it under and sow a better crop next season thus working with the law of eternal motion or evolution toward ultimate completion the gnostic teachings postulate seven interpenetrating spheres surrounded by an eighth which is composed of the leftovers or unredeemed forces left behind by the sevenfold chain of spheres in their onward rush of evolution this eighth sphere is one of absolute darkness hence is often called the dark star and its motion is so much slower than the earth chain to which it belongs that it greatly retards the chain's progress it is out of this eighth sphere that at the dawn of the next great world period the materials will be gathered to form a new sevenfold earth chain just as the eighth note in music while a repetition of the first is nevertheless the beginning of a newer and higher octave this process is alluded to in the teachings of the gnostic marcus as follows now the motion of these seven spheres is exceedingly rapid whereas the eighth sphere is much slower than the motion of the seven mutually interpenetrating spheres and as it were balances the balance of number eight or checks their otherwise too rapid motion by pressure on their periphery number may eighth be compared to a power belt which transmits the power from the drive wheel of the engine to the power wheel of a machine and curiously enough such belts are usually crossed in the exact shape of a figure eight nearly all symbols or objects having the shape of number eight convey the fundamental idea of evolution i e the transmission of the force of one cycle or form into the next higher expression it is at the point of crossing over 
therefore, that we must expect to meet the dread dweller on the threshold who will bar our way until our courage has been proved. Only fortitude and determination at this step can prove that we have learned the lessons of the lower wheel and have demonstrated our fitness to pass on and receive the initiation which must precede. Our entrance into number nine. This is the crucifixion, or the dying upon the cross of the personality, that the Christ, the only begotten Son of God, may rise and sit forever at the right hand of his Father. Only by the way of this cross, via Curus, can man become more than man. The dweller who awaits us at this threshold of our new life is the synthesis of all those mistakes and unredeemed creations which we have pushed behind us during our struggle to reach the perfection of number seven. For in our lower evolution there are many things which we have not the strength completely to conquer. Yet we progress in spite of them, for such things are mercifully held back until we grow to spiritual manhood. But ere we can pass this crucial step we must meet and redeem them in the person of our dweller on the threshold of the new life, just as they await us in a lesser degree at every new step upon the path. But here they must be faced, recognized, conquered, and transmuted ere we can enter the O degree F, the higher evolution. By some writers this dweller is described as a frightful monster of so terrible a mien that at sight of him the candidate is either paralyzed by fear or in rare cases is driven mad from horror. This occurs, however, only in extreme cases where the pupil has failed to conquer fear during the earlier steps or where he has persistently denied all evil and refused to face and recognize his faults and failings, hence has made no effort to redeem them. But the student who has lived close to divine love and who has recognized his power to redeem his creations will have little to fear at this step. For by the recognition of the power of the Christ within the student has learned how gradually to redeem the dweller in his daily steps along the path, in fact, has grown familiar with his face, hence is not appalled. He knows that he can conquer all that his evolution brings to him. Many students are puzzled to know how they will meet the dweller or know when they are upon the threshold of initiation, but there are many experiences which, to one who is truly watching, will indicate it, and many ways to meet the dweller will appear. Some have a symbolic dream or vision, or an experience in life itself brings it to their recognition. One student relates that he had the following dream. He dreamed he stood before a small entrance which seemed to lead into a vast hall. He was eager to enter. But at the door stood a monstrous giant with drawn sword barring the entrance. Seated near the doorway behind a small table was a huge Mongolian noble. The student sought to enter, but the doorkeeper demanded a fee. On asking how much he was to pay, the student was told seventy cents. He handed the doorkeeper seventy-five cents, but the Mongolian would not let him in until he had paid the exact amount, telling him it was impossible to pay more than was demanded. Then the giant lowered his sword and let the student enter. The symbology here is very plain, for seventy cents symbolized seven complete cycles of ten. And only when the candidate for initiation can give to the doorkeeper the value of seven complete cycles can he enter the narrow gate which is the crossing point of number eight. One fault which gives the dweller great power, and which is a great shock when first realized by the candidate, is self-righteousness and spiritual pride. The person whose dweller has been built up through the grosser sins of selfishness, greed, drunkenness, lust, etc., knows all along that he is violating the law and rather expects to pay the penalty sometime. In fact, 
has in all probability had many glimpses of his dweller and knows full well it is his own creation, hence is not so appalled at his handiwork when seen in full. He is therefore far more ready to recognize it as his own creation than the self-righteous person who has lived so long in his artificial sanctity that he cannot believe the dweller to be his. Once having successfully faced the dweller and entered the higher circle of evolution in number eight, we now meet Saturn, the great tester and initiator, whose number is nine. For Satan is the magistrate of the justice of God, he beareth the balance and the sword. For to him are committed weight and measure and number, five the initiator should not be confused with the dweller, for the latter is an entity of our own creation, while the initiator is one of the Elohim or sons of God spoken of by Job. He first appears to us as grim death, the reaper, but as such he comes first to teach us to conquer fear, and second that we may prove to ourselves the power of man, uplifted and sustained by the divine within, to conquer even death, to prove that there is no death, for if we rest in the one life, the divine breath manifesting through number eight will sweep us safely past this point of crossing. Perfect love casteth out fear, hence long ere we reach this step we should have learned in whom we trust. Then is death swallowed up in victory. If we do find the spiral of evolution, like number eight, manifesting to us decay and dissolution, this merely proves that only as the old and useless husk decay can the seed sprout and bring forth. It is ruin only in the sense that the breaking of the shell by the evolving sprout means ruin. Only as the shell is broken can the kernel of the nut be extracted. Number eight should not be regarded as privation, imperfection, corruption or loss, except as we gladly lose the lower or lesser to obtain the higher and greater, or just as a child breaks in ruins or is deprived of its old toys when the time comes in its evolution to take up the serious business of life. Here we gladly lay aside the old thoughts, the old bonds of flesh, even our old ideas and beliefs, especially the thought of our greatness and power. The ability of the unaided personality to meet and conquer all physical conditions. For only as these old conceptions fall away from us one by one, decay and return to their original elements, are we ready to pass through the narrow gate and be weighed in the balance of perfect justice. 